Welcome back to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay in Baltimore. We're continuing our series of interviews with Bob Poland about his new book, Back to Full Employment. And he joins us again from Amherst, Massachusetts, where he is co-director and founder of the Perry Institute. Thanks for joining us again, Bob. Thank you very much, Paul, for having me again. So if you haven't watched part one, go watch part one. Part two, the question is, is full employment under capitalism possible? So, so Bob, some people would suggest the answer to that question is, if full employment under capitalism was possible, they wouldn't be capitalists. In other words, if they did implement the kind of policies you're talking about, it would just go against their nature. And so uh, how, do you, how do you answer that? We have evidence that full employment has operated under capitalism. It certainly operated, as we talked about in the last segment, uh, briefly in the United States in the late 60s and late 90s. Uh, certainly operated in Europe uh, in the early period after World War II. Uh, we have a lot of evidence, uh, for example, in the Nordic countries. Sweden is a really good example of because the unions in Sweden had a lot of political power, they were able to do some very interesting experiments to push the economy toward full employment and stay there. Uh, the, the unions had enough power that they could think about macroeconomic policies to push the economy to full employment, while the unions themselves uh, were focused as well on inflation con and control, restraining inflationary pressures so that you could actually sustain the full employment that would be good for workers over time. And so we do have experience that this has happened. It is a different kind of capitalism. It is a capitalism in which uh, workers have more power, unions have more strength, uh, the concern for the well-being of working people is much higher than it is today, and uh, that's the kind of society I think we need to move toward. Where we go after that, okay, we can, we can talk about where we go after that, but just to get to that point in which public policy is genuinely focused on providing a maximum amount of job opportunities and well-being for people, uh, to get to that point in our policy debates would be a major achievement. And we'll get into that, how you, you think we get there a little further in this series of interviews. Yeah. But, well, let's kind of go step by step here. So give us, trace us a little bit about the history of this debate. Uh, as you said in part one, Marx says it's in the interest of capitalists to have a certain level of unemployment because it right. controls wages. And then Keynes kinds of counters that argument to some extent in terms of the role government could play. So uh, give us a bit of right. the historical background here. Well, I, well I, I go through what I think are the four major thinkers on the theory of unemployment. The first is Marx, and it was Marx who said that having a reserve army of labor, uh, a lot of unemployed people, is necessary for the functioning of capitalism because if you had no unemployment, then workers' bargaining power would go up, uh, workers' wages would go up, capitalist profits would get squeezed. Okay, that's Marx. Now, Keynes came in with a different view. Keynes was thinking more as a technician within the framework of capitalism, and he said, if you do not get to full employment through private investment in the economy, then the government should step in and engage in public investment. That was his term, Keynes' own term, was somewhat comprehensive socialization of investment. And if the government did this somewhat comprehensive socialization of investment, geared towards creating maximum job opportunities, uh, that would be a better society, a different kind of capitalism. Uh, but technically, he said it could be done. Moreover, the central Keynes point was that actually this could be good for capitalists as well, because even though workers would have more bargaining power, you would also have the economy expanding more rapidly, the markets would be more buoyant, there'd be more opportunity for new business investment, just because workers would have money in their pockets and they could buy things, just like Henry Ford was famous in recognizing that if he paid workers decent wages, well, then workers might actually be able to afford to buy Ford automobiles. Right, and, so, and, and this legislation, this, this idea is Keynesian ideas heavily influenced this act that we talked about earlier, the Humphrey Hawkins Act, because if I understand correctly, in that act, it actually says if the private sector 
can't create enough jobs to get unemployment at 4%, then the government should use public works to do it. I mean, it was in the legislation. I don't think it was ever really enacted, because five years later, unemployment's at almost 10%. But, but right. the ideas were very influential. Right. So you have the uh, Marx and Keynes, and those are also reflective of different notions about how capitalist economy functions. Keynes was much more in this social democratic tradition operating within the institutions of capitalism. Now, uh, the third great thinker to mention was a contemporary of Keynes named Michael Kolecki. He was a Polish socialist who was influenced both by Keynes uh, and Marx and had some ideas, obviously, of his own. And what Kolecki said was, okay, Keynes has now shown us how we can utilize the technical apparatus of economic policy to achieve full employment under capitalism, but what Keynes neglects is the change that it would... Uh, create in terms of political dynamics, that it would give workers more bargaining power, and that the capitalists don't want the workers to have so much bargaining power. It would squeeze profits. Kolecki acknowledges all this, and he, therefore he says, though we have the technical tools to achieve full employment under capitalism, we, do, we don't have the political force, and it would be a uh, clear challenge to the prerogatives of the rulers of the society, the capitalists, to do this. So he laid out the real attention there. But the, within Kolecki, there is still the point that if you get a bigger market, uh, then capitalists can benefit from a more buoyant market, even if the wages are higher and the capitalist share of the total market, the income coming back to them, is lower because workers have more bargaining power. That's the tension. And so the, the fourth uh, major thinker, most influential thinker, I would say, on the issue of employment is the leading neoliberal economist, Milton Friedman. And Milton Friedman actually said that we have a natural rate of unemployment under capitalism, which would be full employment. That is, anybody who wants a job would get a job if we only didn't have government policies that created barriers to workers and businesses working things out on their own. The example he cited, one of the big examples cited by Friedman, is uh, minimum wage laws. Because he said, look, and unions. Unions, minimum wage laws get in the middle between the workers and the owners. The workers and the owners can keep bargaining till they got a wage that everyone can agree to and then you would have full employment. You just don't want to have these institutional forces like minimum wage laws, like unions, telling the bosses that they have to pay workers more than the workers deserve. So that kind of sets the whole scene of the debate. Unfortunately, the winner of the debate over the last generation, not just in the US, uh, throughout the world, was clearly Milton Friedman. And so that what we have uh, under neoliberalism for essentially the last 40 years is an abandonment of any attempt by government policy to sustain full employment, to use government policy to, to soak up people that are having a difficulty getting jobs and creating job opportunities for them. You can almost say the objective of government policy was the opposite, was to make sure that unemployment never fell below a certain level because that would, they would say, instigate inflation, their code word for higher wages. So, so and if anything, government policy was the opposite. You should, they wanted what, quote unquote, right. this natural level of unemployment. Right, well that's certainly, uh, you know, Milton Friedman was certainly the, the leading figure in advancing this view in the economics profession and it's spilled into policy making. Uh, and the view was, right, actually the government is incapable of achieving full employment anyway. In fact, government is a barrier uh, by, for example, setting up minimum wage laws, but that the government can do one thing, and that is to control the inflation rate. And so that's what macroeconomic policy should be focused on. Now, it turns out the way you control the inflation rate is by keeping the unemployment rate higher, because uh, precisely if the workers get too much bargaining power, then that enables them to push up their wages, that then means that businesses will try to pass on those wage increases in terms of price increases to consumers, and that's how you get inflation. So you have this notion of the trade-off between inflation 
and unemployment. But that trade-off is, you know, if you look at the period we're talking about, essentially from 1960 forward, the big spikes in inflation didn't have anything to do with uh, high unemployment. Like the biggest periods of inflation were actually periods of also high unemployment. Right. And that was, as we talked about in the last segment, that was due to the oil price shock. So the initial theory of the trade-off between inflation and unemployment completely ignored the fact that there could be other major sources of inflation. It was very convenient, by the way, because, okay, you get an oil shock, inflation goes up, you have a recession, and then the, uh, the Friedmanites of the economics profession say, aha, there is no trade-off. In fact, what we see is government efforts to reduce unemployment are just making inflation worse and aren't reducing unemployment anyway. So let's abandon the whole thing. The whole Keynesian thing is wrong. And that's how we got the macroeconomics that we have now, which brought us to the Great Recession. So in the next segment of our interview, we're going to pursue this discussion. So please join us for the next segment of our series of interviews with Bob Pullen on The Real News Network.